Hi guys, we are here today to talk about five mistakes that I see owner trainers make when choosing a service dog candidate. Now, these are five mistakes that I have noticed are actually quite common throughout my work, both working with hundreds of owner trainers, both online and in person. Some of whom who have professionals help them choose a candidate and others who choose uh, service dog candidates on their own. So today I have these five mistakes that I see for you, um, that I'm gonna share with you, excuse me. But in the link, um, in the description, of this video, I have a link to a blog post I've written where you can get all the information about choosing a candidate, or at least more information about choosing a candidate. So in that blog post, I have a lot more details on choosing a breed, finding an individual dog, and then you can also get the link to our um, evaluation ebook, or you can actually get my evaluation process inside that blog post as well. So that's all in the link at the description at the link in the description of this video is where you can find that blog post and inside the blog post, the link to the ebook um, with the evaluation process. So today I wanna share these five mistakes with you and then you can go to that blog post and that ebook to find even more about choosing a candidate if that's the, um, the phase of this process that you're in. Okay, so one, and this one I see actually happen, well, I see all these happen really often, but I see this one a lot. So this is confusing lack of confidence with human sociability. So one of the things that we really recommend, all professionals say, you know, when you're searching for a service dog candidate, one of the things you're looking for is a dog that is very social with people. A dog who really wants to be with you, a dog who um, really enjoys like verbal and physical praise. Um, so we're really just looking for a dog who really is very social with people very, very um, human motivated, human, you know, all of that stuff. But what I see happen is people confuse what is actually a lack of confidence with this human sociability that is a really important trait we're all looking for. So what I mean by that is if you're going to, for example, um, evaluate a litter of puppies, and again, you can find kind of the information on my evaluation process in the link um, in the description of this video. But if you're going to evaluate a litter of puppies, for example, it's really easy to think that the puppy that hangs out at your feet, the one who refuses to leave you, is being really social, very human um, motivated, very human social or something like that. When in actuality, that puppy may be too nervous to leave the people. I'm going to move just a little bit because I'm kind of sitting in some direct sunlight. There we go. That's better. Um, so what we're looking for is a puppy who is confident enough to leave the humans and go explore his environment, but prefers to be with the people. So generally what I look for there when I'm evaluating, a pu especially a puppy, but this, this matters for older dogs as well. So if you were evaluating um, like a potential candidate in a shelter or something like that, these all apply as well. So what I'm looking for is a dog or a puppy who goes away from me for a few moments at a time to go and explore the environment, to go um, check things out and then returns to me regularly both on his own or when I encourage him to. So if I just do the real general like, hey puppy, come here, you know, does the puppy come rushing back to me because he's really excited to hang out with me or or not, right? So that's where we're looking for human sociability, not a lack of confidence. And I see people confuse those two a lot because on the very surface, they can kind of look the same because in both situations, we have a dog who's staying near the people. So this is one reason that when you go to evaluate a, a potential puppy or a potential adult, older dog, um, we always highly recommend that you bring a professional with you, even if it is a dog trainer who doesn't have a lot of experience with service dogs, because generally they're going to have a lot of experience reading dog body language and helping you separate out something like the difference between lack of confidence and human sociability, right? Um, but if not, make sure you do a lot of homework on dog body language before you go to evaluate your puppy or your, or your adult dog, okay? So throughout this whole video, I mean both. Now, the next mistake I see is confusing independence with confidence. So one of those other traits that we tell people you're looking for in a potential service dog is confidence, right? We want a, we want a puppy or an adult dog who is <laughs> very confident. One of my dogs is in a crate here and she's banging her bowl around. Um, we want a dog who's confident. Confident, right? They're going to need to be able to go into all kinds of different situations, all kinds of environments, around all kinds of distractions, and we need for our service dogs to be confident. 
But independence is not a good trait in a service dog. I do not want an independent dog because if the dog is independent, then he's they're they're just they're a little more challenging to train. They don't tend to care as much about things like verbal praise. Um, we want humans. We want really social with people. We don't want independent. So I've had people talk to me about you know choosing a puppy, and and he was so confident because he just went and he explored the environment, and he was constantly exploring the environment. He didn't ever come back to me and all these things. Um, and so again, this is where a professional can help you pick out you know again independence versus confidence. So this is where again where I'm looking for that puppy or that dog who is confident enough to leave me and is showing confident body language. So, you know, um, not, not getting down and slinky, you know, so this is where you need to look up some dog body language stuff, but I'm looking for a dog who's confident enough to leave me, but then is constantly coming back and wanting to hang out with me or is very easy to call back to me. Um, so we want confident, but not independent. Independence is not a helpful trait in a service dog at all. Now, the next one is not testing food motivation. So this is something that I think a lot of people don't think about until they've tried tried to train a dog who's not naturally very food motivated. Now, what I mean by food motivated, of course, is a dog who will eat food that I offer him under a variety of different circumstances. So I want a dog who is willing to work for food and will take that food from me both at home and around distractions and in new environments. So one of the things that I see is this is something a lot of people don't think about. And if you have a dog currently who's not very food motivated, who you're, you're labeling as having low food motivation, that's definitely, oh, my phone's ringing now. There we go. Um, so, okay, so back to what I was saying. So if you have a dog who has low food motivation, there's a lot that we can do to increase that, to teach our dogs to accept food reinforcers in multiple environments. But service dog training is hard enough. We have a lot of behaviors to teach. We have to teach our dogs to do those behaviors around a lot of environments. We really want a dog who who is very interested in the food, a dog who is... Um, who wants to work for that food is very food motivated. And it's something that I think I just see a lot of people not purposefully test this and then bring home a puppy or an older dog who every time they offer a treat goes, "Mm, you know, maybe I'll take it. Maybe I won't. So food motivation is a big one. And it's something that I recommend that you, you purposefully and intentionally test for. And again, you can find information on that inside our evaluation ebook, which is in the in the link in the description of this video. We'll take you to a blog post that has that ebook. Now, the next one is making the decision based on emotions. So this is one that I know a lot of people are not necessarily going to agree with me with me on, but. This should not be a solely emotional decision. Going in to evaluate a litter of puppies or evaluate some adult dogs, you don't necessarily want to choose the dog that you connected with the most or the dog that um, you know chose you or the dog that you just had this extra spark with or, or you know fill in the blank. Um, Now, if you have multiple dogs who have tested equally, they're people motivated, they're food motivated, they're confident, they've got all these great things going for you, but you have an emotional connection with one dog over the other, then of course, go with that dog. But one of the things that I see a lot of people do is they say, oh, go evaluate a litter of puppies and go with the one that chooses you or go with the one that you feel the connection with. But those dogs don't necessarily have the qualities you need for service work and relationships can be built. You don't have to have this magical X factor in order to have a really great relationship with your dog. I have seven dogs in my home, seven, and only one of them was a dog who I chose because I had an emotional connection with. Okay, every other one was chosen for me by the breeder. My breeder, you know, spent eight weeks with the puppies, knew what I was looking for, did their own evaluations, and chose those puppies for me based on the temperaments that those puppies were displaying over the eight weeks that they were with their breeder. So like a bonus tip here is 
it's really, in my opinion, worth it to go with a very good breeder with lots of service dog experience, even if it means that you have to spend an extra six or nine or 12 months saving up money to be able to afford that puppy's purchase price. But your breeder should have gotten to know their puppies really well, and they should be able to help you make this decision. So in my home, even Leo, my service dog in training right now, he was chosen for me by his breeder, who has a way more service dog training experience than I do. So I trusted her to make that decision. Um, so again, I'm not saying that there's it's not important or, or if you have multiple dogs that test well, not to choose the one that you're feeling this emotional connection with, but this should not be a purely emotional decision. This should be a decision that is also made based on an evaluation test, based on logic, based on your discussions with your breeder or the foster parent or whoever um, who knows the dog better than you to make sure that this dog you're bringing home, this dog that you are banking so much on, that you are investing so much in, has the qualities that is going to help it be a good service dog. This is hard enough without choosing a dog whose genetics or temperament or natural tendencies aren't going to work with you. This is a long enough, hard enough process. There's no reason to make it harder by not choosing the dog that already has the qualities we're looking for. Okay, so then the last one is not thinking through their breed choice. So this is, again, something that I see a lot of people make mistakes on. There are as this is something that I have other videos on and I talk about in depth in the blog post in the link in the description of this video. One of the questions I get a lot is what's the best breed for service work or can fill in the blank breed, can a Dalmatian or a Husky or a German Shepherd or a Cocker Spaniel, can they be service dogs? I'm going to say that you can probably find a good service dog candidate in any breed but you're going to have to search harder in some breeds than in others. So we talk about the Fab Four. You've probably heard about this in service dog training. Labs, Golden Retrievers, Poodles, and Smooth Collies tend to be the Fab Four that people recommend the most for service work because those breeds tend to produce puppies with the temperaments we need for service work. Now, you certainly could go outside of, I know lots of successful owner trainers who use breeds outside of this, okay? So I'm not saying you can't find a good service dog candidate in an, in an off breed, so the one that isn't one of those fab, one of those fab four breeds, but you're going to have to search harder. And I think the other thing that a lot of people don't think about is that if you have a breed outside of those, you're going to draw a lot more attention in public. So if you have a Dalmatian, or you have a Greyhound, or you have a Great Dane, or you have a anything that isn't a Golden Retriever, a Lab, or a Poodle, you're going to get a lot more attention, you're going to get a lot more staring, you're going to get a lot more questions. And that's just something to consider whether you, that's something that's okay with you or not. Um, so if you're somebody who the extra attention in public makes you nervous or it makes your disability worse or it makes things like anxiety attacks or panic attacks happen, then this is a very valid thing to consider. Whether or not the extra attention you're going to get from something like a Samoyed or a Dalmatian um, because can you find a Samoyed or a Dalmatian that makes a good service dog? Probably. I'm sure that those that they do exist. Those breeds don't tend to have the, the temperaments and the qualities we're looking for, but I'm sure they exist out there if you dig deep enough. But you're still going to get a lot more attention with those breeds than you are with something like a lab. So when I have Leo out in public, I never get people who say, oh, what kind of dog is that? And then want to talk to me for five minutes. I get a lot less staring. I get a lot less, I didn't know that breed could be a service dog. I get, I get the occasional, oh, I have a lab at home, right? But I don't get all the stopping and the staring and the questions that I used to get with other breeds that I have brought into public. So Think through the breed. Think through making sure it's a good breed for you and your lifestyle. Make sure that it is a breed that you can find a good service dog candidate in. And make sure that you consider whether or not this extra attention is going to be a problem for you. Um, and you're going to see both in owner trainers and in higher profile um, 
you know, dog trainers who also have service dogs, you're going to see Border Collies or Australian Shepherds or um, Dalmatians or these other breeds that are service dogs. And it's not because they can't be good service dogs. Border Collies, for example. Let's go with Border Collies because I'm a Border Collie person. I've had a bunch of them. I will have more throughout my life. And I have even placed one as a service dog. Generally, Border Collies don't have the, the temperaments we're looking for for service work. Generally. They can be, I'm going to throw a bunch of labels at you. They can be stubborn. They can be low food motivated. They can be um, sensitive and noise sensitive. There are a lot of things going for border collies that don't make them good service dog candidates. That doesn't mean exceptions don't exist. But it means in general, these breeds don't have a lot of the qualities that we're looking for. Um, And so... It's something to consider and really dig in, really, really do your research on the breed because you also want to make sure that it's a good breed for you and your lifestyle. So if you're a very, are you a very active person or do you spend a lot of time at home? Do you have to go to a lot of loud environments? Do you, I mean, do you just, you have to look at your lifestyle and decide whether or not a breed is a good fit for you. And I always recommend reaching out to breeders, to people who own that breed, to owner trainers who have worked that breed, and doing a lot of research to find a good a good breed for you and then a good individual for you. So, like I said, you can absolutely find individual dogs outside of those, those Fab Four, but you're going to have to look harder, you're going to have to dig deeper, and you have to, you're going to get more attention, and that's just something to to consider if that's worth it for you. So again, my, these five mistakes I see a lot are confusing lack of confidence with human sociability. Remember, I want a puppy who's confident enough to explore the environment, would would prefer to hang out with me. Confusing independence with confidence. So confusing a dog who is um, just really independent and is spending way more time leaving me than coming towards me with confidence. Just because you're independent doesn't make you confident. And just because you're confident doesn't make you independent. Independence is, a, is not a helpful trait for a service dog. Independence is a bad trait for a service dog to have. Not testing food motivation. This is something we tend to take for granted. You want to test for this and make absolutely certain that your service dog candidate is interested in food and is going to work for food in all kinds of environments. Um, Making the decision based on emotions is another mistake that I see. This shouldn't be a solely emotional decision. There should be there should be evaluations. There should be conversations with the breeder or the person who knows this dog better than you. There should be some good thought in here. Don't ba- make this decision based solely on your emotions. And make sure that you really think through your breed choice. So if you have always had German Shepherds and you're very good with German Shepherds and you're very experienced with them, then do your digging and, and find the dog that has a good suitable temperament for service work. But if you've never had a German Shepherd, if this is your first dog or something like that, then maybe something like a Lab or a Poodle would be a better choice. So if you guys have any questions about this, you can always ask them inside our Facebook group, Train Your Service Dog with Confidence. We get a lot of discussions in there about choosing the right dog and choosing the right breed for you. And like I said, in the link in the description of this video, is it will take you to the blog post that I wrote on choosing a service dog. It will walk you through choosing a breed, choosing an individual. The ebook link in there is also um, where you can find the evaluation process that I use when I choose a candidate. If I haven't been, match, if I haven't been matched by the breeder. So like I said, you know, Leo's breeder knows a lot more about service dogs than me. So I let her just match me and my client with Leo instead of doing my own evaluation. Um, In my own home, six of my seven dogs were matched for me by their breeder or by their rescue. Um, And that because they knew what I was looking for and they knew the puppies really well. So they were able to match a dog who had the temperament that would fit my lifestyle the best. So that is what I have for you today. If you guys have any questions, check out our Facebook group. Like I said, train your service dog with confidence and then check out the link um, in the description of this video if you need more information on choosing a candidate. And I will talk to you guys later. Have a great night.